Hello and welcome. We are here today with Nestor Espanilla Jr., one of the sources of good news for this week. Congratulations again for being appointed as the incoming Banco Central ng Pilipinas Governor. Thank you very much, uh, Lala. <laughs> has it sunk in? Uh, <laughs> well, it has sunk in, but uh, it hasn't quite moved on. So I'm still adjusting to everything. So mm -hmm. suddenly my world is changed. Mm -hmm. um, it's ironic. I, as a professional, I have sought this. But now that it has been uh, given to me as an opportunity, now, now I'm uh, struggling how to deal with it. Not in the professional sense, but uh, in terms of the how it could change uh, what I'm used to do uh, all, the, all, all those uh, years. Mm -hmm. 36 years in Banco Central yeah. and it, uh, it all gathers up to you know, July to July two. You'll be taking oath in July two. July three. July three. Yeah, that's a Monday, and well, it, it's it's still part of the continuing story, but it's a new chapter, an entirely new chapter. The way I look at it, mm -hmm. and in the first sets of questions asked of me after I was announced, uh, the focus has been on continuity, and that's really uh, what this is. But I define it as continu con continuity plus plus mm -hmm. because there are certain things that I do that I care about and I, I'd like to pursue more vigorously during my term. Which we will discuss in a bit. Uh, in one of your interviews, you actually <coughs> referred to it as more of a relay. You know, you, ref you mentioned something like a basketball uh, a I, game uh, where yeah. your captain is moving on and you're just taking on a different role. That was a pretty nice way for an economist to, to, to explain what you're going through. Well, uh, we have been, I, I guess the years have brought us together and forged us into a team, especially so during the time of uh, Governor Tatanko. Uh, and he was our superb captain mm -hmm. uh, for 12 years. Mm -hmm. But life goes on. So the captain graduates and the team adjusts. Mm -hmm. And it will not be the same type of plays uh, that we will be doing as we had done in the past, but the passion and the spirit is going to be sustained. Mm -hmm. So, but we have to figure out uh, our own uh, ways of approaching the challenges. And the challenges are not the same. Yes. They will evolve. Yes. And in fact, they are starting evolve already. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, the environment that we are facing today is, uh, in a sense, not the same environment as, let's say, what Governor Tatanko and us as his team members faced then. Mm -hmm. So it's a new game. It's a new chapter. Mm -hmm. Which makes it exciting at the same time. Yes, I am excited because of, um, I look at it in terms of opportunities uh, to, do, to, do, to, to do things that matter. Mm -hmm. So that excites me. <laughs> and you have also said that you know, with a higher uh, position, you'd be able to um, not just continue what you have done as a team with Governor Tatanko, but as well have a different uh, or a bigger responsibility or bigger stake in what's, uh, what's about to happen in the coming days or coming uh, uh, challenges ahead. Well, uh, definitely there is uh, more responsibility, a lot more responsibility. And uh, when I was announced, that's the one thing that I, in a way, perhaps it's psychological, I've started to feel the weight of the responsibility. You don't mean that. Um, uh, like in a, um, I mean, when you say you felt the weight of the responsibility, uh, how did that uh, manifest itself? No, I, I had to, because my first thought was, here is something that I had aspired for, and yet uh, I am well aware of the formidable challenges ahead, and so there's a lot of work to be done. So you cannot but uh, pause and reflect uh, on your next uh, steps. And the last few days, 
in a way uh, has compelled me to take a look at things again from a from that different perspective even while I'm continuing to fulfill the the job that I'm currently assigned to so in a way it's more tiring because I'm double hatting mm -hmm. I'm I'm doing what I'm what I have to do as a current deputy governor but I also have to start planning and thinking uh, on what I'll do when mm -hmm. I formally assume the position mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in July, on July 3. Mm -hmm. Actually, before this, we spoke with um, former uh, Central Bank Governor Jose Quisha, and he shared with us uh, the pressures that he had to go through being, you know, doing the top job that you're about to, to assume. And he shared, like, the phone calls that he would get from uh, politicians and the different <clears throat> powers that be those are something that you have to also uh, face or something that you have already experienced in the past and how are you preparing for it well um, it really comes with the territory I have uh, come to accept that even as a deputy governor I already have those kinds of uh, exposures I've had Phone my calls. I, I've had my share of let's say appearing in Congress explaining what has happened to certain things uh, so I have also attended congressional meetings to advocate uh, important legislation that uh, that uh, we need to get done so so that's part of the experience that I can leverage on and bring to the job mm -hmm. so probably uh, Governor Quisha is uh, alluding to the fact that I'll see more of those and I accept that as a fact of life. Mm -hmm. Well, you're known in the industry as someone who is brave and bold having played the role of a bad cop to banks that have not been performing well or performing or have not been very prudent. Where do you draw the strength and that bravery um, something that you may also have to go through when you assume your position and uh, ex exposed to all of these pressures? That's a, that, that's a very uh, tough question. But in a sense, for me, it's easy. Because uh, essentially, I, I'm, I'm here, I'm doing a job. Uh, <clears throat> the job is not I'm not doing it for personal interest. Uh, our mandate is clear and our constituency is clear. I serve the public or we serve the public. And today, my job is to make sure that our banking system is uh, safe and sound. That's a basic requirement. And I am guided or we are guided by laws. We are guided by principles and standards. And my, my, my feeling is uh, so long as I uh, stick to those standards and uh, principles and remain objective and fair, balanced and, um, uh, and engaging and listening to the points of view, I, I feel that the job uh, is uh, manageable and uh, the pressure can be, uh, can be addressed. So. So to me, maybe all the years have uh, given me the experience to deal with that kind of uh, pressure and such that it has become a uh, second uh, nature. Uh, sometimes the toughest part of my job is having to, uh, when we have come to a point when, let's say, a financial institution has um, come to a point where we will have to uh, close down its operations because uh, it's no longer viable. It is, uh, in a sense, a heavy burden uh, to carry because you know full well that, um, that there are people behind that financial institution. It's not like you're closing a physical object. So, but then um, every act that we do is a product of a thorough study and weighing of the, uh, of the facts and uh, the situation and so if so long as we stay objective and stick to those things uh, I feel that I can take action when we need to take action 
and uh, and be able to sleep very well uh, after that because you know that uh, you have not been unfair uh, to anyone and that uh, you have uh, you have merely done your job in the interest in the bro in the broader interest of the public so that keeps me uh, sleeping very well oh sir that's actually the first time I hear you say that because I've covered um, banks that have you know strayed or have been closed by your team for a while and you always come out as someone who's very strong but I didn't realize that uh, the thought process that uh, and the emotions that come to it um, also come to play I mean like <clears throat> considering the other factors aside from just following the law and uh, um, the, actually your impact to to the institutions that are also being closed yeah, it's a heavy burden actually uh, and there are always options and closing a bank is always a last resort uh, for the BSP. And before that, we try to manage the situation. So we have a whole uh, system on how to manage a bank to, first of all, nurse it out of initial problems and then follow it through uh, to the point until we come to the conclusion that the situation can no longer be addressed otherwise. The public wouldn't know because a lot of the work that we do is covered by uh, the need to keep confidential uh, these these things. So what the public tends to see uh, very often are the seeming spectacular failures, the closures. Mm -hmm. But the public doesn't really appreciate or doesn't see the the successes because we cannot talk about. Uh, banks that remain uh, operating and we measure our success in terms of the vitality of the banking system today so <clears throat> so one way to look at that is compare the banking system from a decade ago a decade ago the banking system had to deal with a lot of issues conflicts of interest credit was not flowing really well uh, people were concerned about the stability of the banking system. But now I think, uh, and our data shows that it's a much improved situation. Banks well capitalized, liquid, and granting credit um, in a sustainable manner. And this is assessed by third parties. Yes. So <clears throat> the record is there. Well, actually, um, one of the things, I mean, as far as the bank's banking system is concerned, I think we've established the fact that uh, You've done a good job there. Um, you've done a sort, a series of um, Thank you. Um, uh, punishing and rewarding and promoting and regulating all those uh, possible things that you could do as a regulator. Um, and it's a banking system that has learned through the different crises, including the Asian financial crisis, which led you to actually increase the uh, capital requirements, which is why we have a very robust um, and healthy financial system at the moment. But uh, the thing that you're most passionate now, at, um, well, something that I realized is that uh, uh, your, your, your advocacy on financial inclusion, and um, that is outside the traditional central bank uh, men menu. And uh, one of the things that you've um, helped uh, advocate is the technical, technology, technological aspect to it. So you're not just looking at central banking as you know, just the traditional institutions that you have at your at your disposal or that you're overseeing, but you you're thinking out of the box actually. <laughs> Because, you know, the way uh, I would suggest we should look at this is uh, the banks, the banking system exists for a public policy purpose. Mm -hmm. They are there. They should exist to serve the public, our people. Now, we can talk about strengthening the banking system. And that's a first order business because without a strong banking system, there's nothing to work with anyway. So 
But that's a first order problem. And we have done our best to strengthen our banking system and that's measurable. But then you stand back and reflect on the situation. Here we are, we have a, a good, robust banking system, but you ask, whom does, uh, whom does it serve? If it's only primarily uh, concentrated in the urban areas, in the national capital region, if it's only uh, operating in the big cities, if it's only primarily serving uh, big business, then, then what, is the, what public policy purpose is being served by a banking system? And yet, around us, within the economy, there's poverty. There's, uh, in the agricultural sector, the rural areas, credit is not flowing. Um, MSMEs have a hard time uh, obtaining uh, credit. People are not able to um, access financial services for their needs, for remittances. It's very expensive to move money from point A to point B or cross-border. Um, people have complaints about the quality of financial services. So, so uh, if you have those kinds of issues and you don't address those, then in a sense, the banking system is not fulfilling its public policy purpose. So it cannot be complete. So that's why uh, we have, as we have moved to strengthen the banking system, have also focused on the strategic objective of financial inclusion. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of that is to essentially make if I were to summarize it, nobody gets left behind. So the banking system is there, and anyone and everyone can use those services in a way that is affordable and efficient for them. Mm -hmm. So that is a high-level vision. The challenge is, how do we reconcile and strike the balance? Because you can always go overboard and say, let's be liberal and give credit and take ev everybody uh, on board. But then you have to worry about the stability of those financial institutions because if they fail, then those people are, are going to be harmed. Mm -hmm. If you are loose with your policies, bad elements uh, penetrate the banking system. Uh, illegal funds flow through it. So it's a constant battle of striking the right balance between several objectives of safety and soundness, of maintaining the integrity, of protecting consumers, and promoting at the same time uh, financial uh, inclusion. So, so in a way, uh, the BSP has uh, distinguished or differentiated itself from many uh, central banks that are also regulating financial institutions. Because of that uh, sense of the need to balance uh, multi-objectives or multi-tasks without losing sight of your basic uh, mandates. Today, that's captured in terms of proportionality, uh, principle, risk-based principles. And uh, globally, I think there's, there's been recognition of our efforts uh, now. And uh, for example, the Brookings Institution Study and Economic, uh, Economist Intelligence Unit characterize our, in our regulatory framework as one of the most enabling uh, regulatory frameworks for financial uh, inclusion. Mm -hmm. And I myself now, I have the uh, hat of uh, chairing the uh, Basel Consultative Group uh, uh, work stream on financial inclusion, where uh, that gives the, us the opportunity to engage other uh, bank regulators globally and share our experiences and distill that into frameworks that they also can adopt in their own jurisdictions. Isn't that uh, ex yes. exciting? Yes, and understand we are the first central bank in the world to have a unit dedicated for looking for ways for financial inclusion to, um, I, to materialize. You know what? I think so. Yes. Because uh, back in, I, I took office as deputy governor in 2005. Uh, one of my early projects was to recommend the formation of, to me, uh, two important units that um, traditionally have not been a focal point for bank regulators. And this is the unit uh, that focuses on promoting mm -hmm. financial inclusion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, advocacy. Mm -hmm. And the other one is consumer protection uh, unit uh, within the BSP. So mm -hmm. that reflects 
uh, our early recognition of the need to have a more balanced approach to this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the way that under I understand it is that the, uh, this payment system, uh, the end goal is to be able to um, um, transact across different banks, different branches, different even um, retail outlets, pawn shops, remittance centers, even your mobile phones. Okay, so that's a new <coughs> that's a new phase that we are uh, opening national retail payment system. That flows from the realization that if we wanted to include universally people into the financial system, we now have to start thinking out of the box. If we will only rely on the traditional methods of establishing branches in every city, that will take forever. Yes. And in fact, today, uh, more than a third of our municipalities don't even have a banking office. Although pawn shops tend to be ubiquitous and other kinds of non-financial institutions. So that, that is an insight that we uh, would like to capitalize on and leverage leverage on. So what is the fresh approach that we are uh, taking? So in addition to encouraging banks or allowing banks to form smaller units called, let's say, micro banking offices, uh, we realize that you need a digital solution mm -hmm. to be able to make uh, access to finance truly affordable and efficient. And for that to happen, you need to create the infrastructure the policy framework, uh, and this is what the National Retail Payment System strategy is all about. In addition to that, we recognize that banks alone cannot be the providers of financial services. So all around us there are pawn shops, remittance agents, so we need to bring them into the net so that they can cooperate and coordinate with one another under a regulated and uh, a framework that also protects consumer uh, interest. And you will see that, for example, in January this year, we unveiled our policy on agent banking. Mm -hmm. Agent banking is about banks now being able to use merchant establishments like convenience stores, uh, pharmacies, tindahans, as their partners for dispersing and accepting money into the bank. It's as if you have... Mm -hmm. Uh, it's actually, uh, the way I look at it, it's like an ATM machine, except mm -hmm. that it is uh, a physical ATM, uh, ATM machine. So these are stores with POS devices, mm -hmm. and uh, when you transact, that's tantamount to already transacting with the bank. Mm -hmm. Not much, not, not mm -hmm. unlike an ATM, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it is a semi-automatic yes. ATM. So those are some of the ideas. Now, uh, in terms of the NRPS, so what we're now um, getting the banks and other non-banks to do, including electronic money issuers, is to come together and have a to cooperate in terms of accepting each other's payment instructions, so that you yes, that's the one I'm most excited so about. So, as yes. a you as a consumer, so there are two specific mm -hmm. use cases that we are launching uh, this year. Uh, it's called PesoNet and uh, and InstaPay. What is PesoNet? So it's a batch, what's technically called a batch electronic fund transfer uh, mechanism. Essentially what it does is that uh, you, Lala, you have a bank account. And for example, me, uh, you're in bank A. And uh, I have a bank account in bank B. You want to send money to me, so you issue payment instruction via a device, be that a mobile phone, or uh, online, or even by phone, mo for money values to transfer from your account straight into my account. So potentially, this will uh, reduce the reliance on checks. The more traditional way is you give me the physical yeah. money straight, or uh, uh, you, you issue a check to me and then I deposit it. That, so that's the more traditional way. Now here, electronically, you can we, have created, we are creating an enabling environment that will allow you to issue instructions so that the money transfers to me directly. So replicate that uh, in transactions with government. So for example, government, uh, you are a, an employee of government who wants to pay your salary 
uh, you have your own bank account in your own in your in the bank of your own choice, not into a not in a government bank. So uh, the government issues a batch instruct an instruction for the payroll to be paid out electronically to all of the accounts of the employees. So in one electronic transaction, so all of your funds, all of your accounts are credited with your salaries. Mm -hmm. So that's on the receiving end. And, and uh, for merchants, you want to, to pay a merchant, you can pay a merchant by debiting your account electronically and then transferring that to the account of the merchant. So the, this process of turning digital, these transactions, will move us away from a largely cash-based economy or paper-based economy. We did a study back in 2014, and the results of that showed that uh, the totality of retail payment transactions in our economy, more than 20 billion a month, only 1% of that is done electronically today. So the rest of the, the rest 20 is billion is pay, cash you, or pay, check? You pay cash or you cut a check. That's where we are today. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of inefficiencies aso mm -hmm. associated with that. Uh, so, so that is an exciting new journey. But you know, once you have established that, that doesn't just serve uh, ordin ordinary people, but that's also a great tool for financial inclusion. How so? For example, if you are a small business, uh, your transactions captured electronically generate data. Mm -hmm. And that data can be analyzed to give you, to give information about you that can be the basis for granting a credit decision. So, mm -hmm. you know, the innovations now by analyzing your payment patterns in terms of, let's say, your social media activity or mobile phone usage, algorithms have been created already to uh, develop credit scores that enable credit providers based on that um, analyzed information to give credit. So that, that's very enabling. And you don't have to go to the bank to physically draw money and the, the, the loan proceeds can be credited electronically to your account. Mm -hmm. So if you are a small vendor minding your store, mm -hmm. you don't have to break off from selling to go to the bank maybe for and line up there for one hour, so you can do your banking transactions from where you when where you are doing your selling activities. So that creates efficiencies and for empowerment small as yes. far as the individuals and institutions are concerned. Right. So mm -hmm. and and you are able to access uh, finance, uh, credit uh, easily, and there's competition since there will be providers and then you will get better rates because competition always results in uh, better rates. Because the banks would like to also offer the same services at lower cost or show off their Yeah, network. And banks will not just be competing with, with banks. Non-banks are coming into our uh, financial system. The BSP's uh, regulatory approach there is we allow competition even from these non-banks provided that if they are doing an activity that is uh, a regulated activity, then they have to uh, fall under uh, oversight. Mm -hmm. So it's a level mm -hmm. playing field. So in, you'll notice that even virtual currencies are... Bitcoins. Are There's now a specific regulations yes. that cover uh, the use of uh, virtual currencies such as Bitcoin uh, for remittance transactions. Oh, so that's all part of the bigger picture and the bigger goal of uh, digitalize, digitizing yes. payments so, and transactions. And, and giving mm. uh, consumers choice mm -hmm. in terms of how they will be able to transact, whether that's for uh, savings, for credit, for remittance and payments, mm -hmm. and now even micro-insurance. Mm -hmm. Oh, insurance So too. you'll be able okay. to get insurance for specific activities for specific periods of time. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, the possibilities, the innovations that are being generated at a rapid phase we are positioning our financial system to be able to, to engage in all of that. Mm -hmm. So, so the, you, but you're only able to do those things if the financial system is fundamentally safe and sound. So you cannot get away, you cannot yeah. be carried away by all of the new technology and forget about capitalization, 
forget about liquidity. You cannot, you cannot uh, ignore those things. So we have to always keep a balance on those things. So those are parallel efforts, goals yes. as well. I was going to ask you who your um, idol is as far as central banking is concerned, but it sounds like you're on a league of your own. So I was just going to go through to my last question, which is um, how do you keep yourself physically healthy? I ask that because um, you're up for a very high pressure, grueling job. There's a lot of uh, traveling involved and meetings, etc. And your predecessors have had health issues. So how do you <laughs> <That's scary. laughs> uh, assure us that you are also taking care of yourself? Well, uh, the challenge is always time because, uh, you know, I, I do try to stick to some uh, exercise routines. I go to the gym when I can, especially on weekends. I, I'm a pet lover. Uh, my, my refuge uh, for uh, if, let's dogs. say there's pressure. Mm -hmm. So I walk my dogs. That, that calms me down. Okay. Just staring at my dog sleeping and doing nothing calms me down. So <clears throat> I find comfort in those uh, little things uh, and disengage my mind uh, for a while so that uh, you can I'll take some respite. So that has been my rut routine uh, all those years. I'd like to keep that, um, in a way, that simple life as much as I can um, under this um, changing environment. But I do recognize that things will have to change. For example, I'll have to be more mindful of security arrangements. Yes. So that will, uh, in a way, that's sad. <laughs> Uh, but I'll try not to be restricted as much as I can. Uh, but there are things that you accept uh, because it, it goes with the territories, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you very much for sharing your time with us and for accommodating us for this interview. We wish you well and uh, good luck and more power, um, especially starting July. Uh, six years is uh, up ahead. Um, Thank you very much for joining us for Rappler Talk. Join us again next time.